here and just keep going. I can't stand still for Jesus. I don't know, but I just can't. God, God, you have to move for God. If I could move for anything else, it should be God. Amen? It should be Him that I'm, I'm excited for and that I'm giving yes. glory to. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Church, it is Resurrection Sunday! Come on, it's not even Super Bowl Sunday. Resurrection Sunday! Let's go! Come on! He's so good! Man, he's so, so good. Come on. Listen, we're going to uh, greet some people for a minute. Why don't you do me a favor? Pull your phones out, take a selfie, and tag Remnant Church. Check in at Remnant Church on Facebook. And uh, just greet somebody around you real quick. We're going to transition real fast and get back into worship. But uh, I encourage you to do it. I'm going to do it right here with my, my phone. Listen, church should be fun. And we're going to uh, we gonna uh, let everybody know, guess where I'm at? I'm at church today. Guess where I'm at? We at church. Having church. Checking it out. Here, I'll, I'll have uh, old boy Bob in here. Boom. <laughs> awesome Jesus. You're like, why do you do this? Because we're going to get the gospel everywhere. It doesn't matter how we do it. We're going to get it done. Woo! We at church. I'm going to make a post this week, and you need to share it because it's, it's too good. It just says, church is important to me, and then just share it everywhere, because it should be. The house of God should be important. We're excited what God is doing. Let me give you a quick announcement real, real, real fast. If you have a child in here that is, what's the age, three, the pre-K, potty trained, because right now we don't have the nursery open and the movers room open. And uh, be praying for us, we're gonna be getting soon, trying to transition into that. But if you have a child that's three to pre-K, potty trained and above, I promise they need to be back there because they're gonna miss out if not. Oh, yeah. We got a lot of pride. There is bikes, there is baskets, there is so much stuff back there that they're gonna raffle and give away. So we don't know when church is over, some of these kids are going to roll up with some stuff. So I hope you came prepared. Uh, if you're not, I don't know. Just do what you got to do with your vehicle. But have no fear. If a child is in here, Come on. Um, we got a basket for them as well. So if a child's in here, we have a basket. We have, uh, yeah, of course, boy baskets and girl baskets. So we will work that all out. That will happen at the end of service. So be prepared that when church is over, before we leave, we will have, we got some amazing hosts in this room that are going to come out and give you some of these baskets. But if you are uh, in elementary or anything and you would like to go back there, I promise there is so much stuff and so much candy and so many prizes and they're going to be getting a worship on while we're speaking. You'll hear it. you start bumping in here. It ain't even us. It's them back there. And they're going to be praising the Lord, hearing the gospel, all the above. So... Just encouraging you, take the children, get them back there, because uh, man, they're, they're doing an amazing thing back there, so we're excited about that. Last thing before we transition, through those double doors, everybody look over there, those double doors, it's hard because it's out of the way, so out of sight, out of mind. You're all dressing nice, you smell good. Uh, we have a photo wall. Our friend Larry built a wall of balloons, so. We need you to, uh, when church is done, when that's all said and done, listen, we got all kinds of stuff we're going to be doing. we got stuff to give away when you walk out, the, out of this house. There's all kinds of stuff we're going to give you for your family. And uh, we have, uh, Mackenzie's going to be taking pictures. And so we will post all of those in a big old deal on Facebook, on our Facebook page. So take family photos over there. We will take them. You know, it's nice to have a nice iPhone that has, like, cinematic views and pictures, whatever. So, I still got a flip phone in my drawer. I ain't using that. But uh, they did come out with a new Razor flip phone. I might get that. They can't afford it. Never mind. Uh, but anyway, take photos with your family and your friends, anybody. We're all family. So, uh, 
unless somebody weird just pops behind the balloons, you know what I mean? Hey, that's all right. Like, hey. Hey. It's <laughs> whatever. Photo bombers are okay. Yes. So we encourage you to do that. Uh, we had to put it over there because of the space deal out here and here. So it's awesome. We're you excited said, about it. You said last thing. This is not the last thing. Well, last but thing. But you would know. You would after. know. You would know. I don't know. No, you wouldn't know because we're the ladies in the house. Oh, Come on, ladies. Give me one more time. We're the ladies in the house. Yeah. That's right. Coming up on April 16th, we are having a ladies' night. We are excited. We it's are ladies' going to go. night. And I feel like a woman. Oh, what an old See? Oh, my God. But they don't know. They don't know. I'll wear, they, 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 I'll wear a wig. I'll wear somebody's. Never mind. You get no, you I'm going to bust out somebody's weave and pop it and lock it. I love you. You look good, but not that much for a woman. I love you, but not like that. That don't work. That don't pass like that, okay? I love you, but not trying to be mean, but it don't work. No men are allowed. It's 18 and up only. It's going to be on Friday, April 16th. It will be at Miss Kaylee's house. We're excited to go there this time. It's going to be awesome. We're asking you that you invite your friends so take some flyers with you as you leave today invite your friends not only that we're asking that you bring a finger food a lawn chair and come ready to enjoy and ladies how many of you got to catch in on the devotional that we did last yeah. time for the I think it was like the seventh day devotional or whatever come on yes. put your hand down on the seventh how many of you even though you did because you have a video but whatever so but listen <laughs> It was awesome. I believe that it's our job to encourage one another, to grow one another. If you are not a part of Remnant Women on our face group, our, our face group. Face group. Uh, it's, all, it's all out there now. What so is it's that? good. Um, I hope you enjoy the laugh at home today. Media? So listen, yeah, face group. Whatever it is, Facebook Women's Group, that thing. If you are not on it and a part of, of it, we want to make sure that you get a chance to click on there to join because it is for women only. It's a way that we stay connected. We encourage one another on there. We uplift one another. And we will be posting our new devotional videos on there. But you don't want to miss the 16th because it's starting in person that night. And so it's going to be pretty awesome. We're excited just to hang out and have fun. And I'm telling you, every time we get together, we have a good time. We had a good time, so we just want to invite you to that and make sure that you come and be a part, ladies, on April 16th. I don't care if this is your first time here and you're like, I just came. I don't care. You can come then, too, because we're going to have fun, and we're going to enjoy it, because yes. that's what we do. We're building the kingdom. We're building relationships, and one thing that we say is that we at Remnant like to be real, real women creating real relationships that last, not, not just for a moment. We're here to grow each other. We put all that catty stuff aside. It doesn't matter. We're here for one another, ages 18 and up, to build you and help grow together. So we're excited for that, right? Amen. 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 It is amazing. I get to have a night for myself. It's amazing. Amen. No kids? I'm, I'm fine. I'm a baby. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have a built-in one now. Who? Who's built-in? No, oh, yeah, she's 14 now. Yeah. He knows. You know when your kids get a little older and they can take out the trash? And they can start doing the things you don't want to do anymore? We're not having, you know, free labor. I mean, we, we pay him because we turn the lights on and have AC and they got shoes and they got clothes. They drip them good. So, get to work. No. <laughs> you're allowed. You're allowed. You're allowed to be here. You're allowed. Yeah, you're allowed. Oh, crazy. Anyway, um, we're going to get into some uh, offering real quick. I want to talk to you about the goodness of God. Amen. And I'm telling you right now that, one, you can't out, you can't out give God. That's right. You can't do it. That's right. You can try. And what I find out is when we give, it blows, to me, it blows my mind because... It, it's just life changing. And when it's all said and done in the life changing moments, I love this song. Anybody heard the new gyro from Elevation Worship? You gotta listen to it, yeah. But in giving, it's our opportunity. And so, you know, our buckets are up here. We do that. If you feel comfortable coming up, 
we have envelopes in the back, got a bucket back there, just because of the whole social distancing thing and all that kind of stuff that we're trying to figure out. Um, but I'll, I'll just say this, as you stay faithful in your tithe, and it's an obedience thing, it's not nobody asking you for your money or nothing. It's just an obedience thing. We can't help but give. I'm not gonna give God my, my, my leftovers. Oh, if I, you know, here's my leftovers, me pulling out my wallet and grabbing a, grabbing a few bucks. I won't give God from the top, from the tip top of what I do. And so in that, guys, listen, that's our obedience. That's how uh, God is just blessed. You know, in 2020, through the pandemic, can I stop and say something about the pandemic? We're at church today and it's Easter Sunday. Please believe and remember that we all sat in houses and had our little emoji cups doing, doing communion and trying to figure out how to do all this stuff at home. But one thing happened. People stayed faithful. People kept giving. People dropped off offerings and online and on their phone and just kept giving because they believed in what God's word said. I want to have his covering in my life. I can't help but give. I want to give him the first fruit right from the top. So I encourage you anytime during this service, if you feel deep, come up and give. Back there, give. Do it on your way out. Just, I, I, I encourage you, do not, I wouldn't walk out of this room and not give. Not because you want to give to the church. I'm just saying because God's going to bless you out of control. Because that's how good he is. It's our obedience. He's called us to this Resurrection Sunday. And on Resurrection Sunday, we lift up the name of Jesus. And guess what? We do this all the time. It's Resurrection Sunday every Sunday at Remnant Church. All week long, we talk about the goodness of God. And maybe you're new and you're looking around at these dang mountains and like, what the heck have you guys done in this building? No, crazy. It's that Pat. That, hey, listen, that new pastor is cuckoo sometimes. He's weird. You'll meet him later. Uh, but I'm telling you right now, there might be some mountains in your way. But I'm telling you, as you give, guess what happens? The ground starts to rumble in your life. Because whatever has held you back, whatever's been in your path, it can move. It can move today. Because this is the day the Lord has made. Can I do something different today? It's, it's Easter. Can I do something different before you? Listen, we got a little bit of time. Yeah. I know your roasts are on. I don't want to burn them. It's all good. Can I have? Uh, can I do something different, guys? For real? Like I'm gonna change. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift gears real fast. Yeah. I need to have. Uh, I need to have Mackenzie K. Come up here with me. Oh, let's do it again. If you don't know, this is my baby sister. It's the baby. It's the baby. God laid you on my heart. And I'm going to do this without crying. I didn't cut onions. My, I'm a man. So, is God the sheep are loud today. I have to do something with them. <laughs> I love you. I love you with my whole heart. God told me to do something. I think, I think the the concept of, of this, and I, I questioned it because I'm like I'm not I'm not this way because I'm I'm a I'm a private guy in, in areas. And he said, no, I, I, want, I want you to do something because I want faith to rise in this room and give people hope. And I'm glad you're home. And I love you with a fierce love. I love you so much. I know you've been through a lot. I know there's been ups and downs. But I can tell you one thing. You are a worshiper. You worship the Lord. You fight through it. You're a, you're a great example of love. You're a great example of, 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 of fighting through any, any situation. 
And I want to go with another moment without doing something for you. And I want to give you my car today. You can put that picture up there. You ain't gotta pay for it. You ain't gotta worry about nothing. It's yours. It's not mine. It was never mine. You, you don't have to struggle anymore. You don't have to worry about rides. And God's gonna provide. Do I need a vehicle? It doesn't matter. What I need, I just know for a fact that God told me to do this and do it publicly. And I was going to do it privately because we're always together. But he said, make it public because the ground is rumbling because faith is rising and mountains are moving today. It's Resurrection Sunday for you. Yeah. It's Resurrection Sunday. And so I want to give it to you. Church, do you hear me? Yeah. Right, did we just give away another car at Remnant Church? It's not about Jeremy and Cher. It's not about Brandon and Jen. It's about Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going in the shop Tuesday. It's not that it's broken. It's fine. I just want to make sure it's all good for you. So it's going in. I'm going to get it tuned up or whatever it takes. I've already got the windows replaced. I've already went and detailed it. I've already done all the work. It's actually sitting across the street because I drove it in this morning. Someone's like, you broke that car in this morning? I drove that for a while. I've been stirred all week because I know what God told me to do. And it doesn't matter because, please hear me, church, all you have is all you need to bless somebody. Yeah. There's no strings attached. I know you struggle with, with surprise. And, uh, but I love you. And, and God love you. This isn't about me. This is about the Lord. This is not about me and my wife. This is about Jesus Christ. And he sees you. He knows you. He knows you. The plans. Guys, do you hear me? Exceedingly, abundantly, all you may ask. Exceedingly. More than you could ever ask. I hope that, that it rises today. That faith is rising in the room for whatever you've asked for. Whatever's going on in your life, it doesn't matter. Do not be afraid to give. God will take care of it because he has a purpose why he wants you to give. So right now the insurance is in my name. I'll keep it in there as long as you need me to, until you need to pay it. I'll pay it. There might need to be some things later, but God's going to provide. He's going to provide the money. He's going to provide everything. It's no, this ain't nothing. But I'll hold on to it until you're ready. And I'll do it every yep. Welcome home. We love you. I love you so much. He's good, church. He's good, church. Hallelujah. That's yours. It's sitting out there. And please believe, I measured it because I was trying to pull it in that door right there. <laughs> I did. For real, I was like, I'm going to bust the wall out. I'm going to pull Larry and get a chainsaw and cut the wall out. I was going to roll it right up in here. <laughs> Big lunch box. That's all it is. Toaster screw roll or toaster on wheels, whatever you want to call it. It's awesome. But listen, here's what's crazy. Look what has happened here at Remnant Church in the last week. We've given over 100,000 pounds of food. In, a, in an event for thousands of people. We got extra food, so we just went to the projects in different places and kept giving it away. Yeah. We had overflow, five and two, fishing and some bread, and so we blessed five churches for their Easter outreach to reach people that we're not reaching right here. Yeah. Do you see what's happening? And it's Resurrection Sunday. There's a great exchange. He sees you. He wants you. He wants to use you. Right. Today's the day. It's exciting. Right. I'm telling you, we are the church. Yeah. Come on, say it with me. We are the church. We are the church. Say it. We are the church. Say it like you mean it. We are the church. We are. We're the church. And if the church would step up and do something, you see miracles happen. See life transform. 
So he's, he's got you. He's got his eye right on you. Right. Right. Don't even have to worry about it. All you have to do is put your car seats in it and drive away. He's got you.
And we're thankful for Resurrection Sunday. We're so thankful for what you did on the cross. When all hope seemed lost, it wasn't. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for this transition. Thank you for everybody in this room. It was not an accident. We are here on purpose, with purpose. Everybody in this room is here for a reason. God, this is your service. We dedicate it to you. We're excited. We're passionate. There's a buzz in this city about who you are. God, I pray you touch every church in our city that is lifting you up, and that is making your name famous. Pray that salvation explodes in all the churches across this city. We thank you for what you're doing in all these churches. And we're good. We have one goal, and it's only you. We thank you. This house, we lift you up. Praise to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. If you ain't been here for a while or you're new, I'll tell you what. People ask us about our church and about worship and I can just tell you this I, I feel like we're just very passionate about who God is so it's expressive I, and, and I see it this way how can I go to a football game or a basketball game and high five drunk people I don't know but I can't lift my hands and get hyped for Jesus that, that took the cross and won and gave me freedom you see what I'm saying People make church weird. Church ain't weird. You're weird. Well, welcome home. But you know what I'm saying? We make it so weird and awkward, but yeah, we go act a fool somewhere else. When Nelly comes, boys, we take our shirts off. And, ooh, it's getting hot in here, right? <laughs> now, but you see what I'm saying? We, we have this warped mindset sometimes how worship should be or should not be. And so I'm just telling you right now, he's been so good, I can't help but not to worship. Because my butt would be dead or in jail if not. I shouldn't even be in this room today. Anybody else shouldn't be in this room today? Is anybody going to testify and say, if it wasn't for the grace of God, down and out? That's what the gospel's about. That's what the whole thing is about. That's what we talk about all the time. How good he is. Listen, me giving away a car wasn't just about me. Please believe, throw me off that pedestal real fast. See, you don't know me. I had bankruptcy. Oh, man, you're a pastor with bankruptcy? Oh, I better, I better resign real quick. Huh? Man, you might want to clean something out of your own eye first. When no way hit my house, our cars, ain't nothing like having car seats and babies in them and a repo guy comes and snatches it up while you're walking back to the vehicle. And a recession and all that happened. And thank God we went through that seven years and we're debt free and clear of all that. And you know what I'm saying? Like we had to go through that. We didn't know what was going on. But I'll sit back and look and say, God, you, you give me the ability to get a vehicle and to pay it off and turn around and give it away. Which I shouldn't have been able to do any of that. Because honestly, if I was thinking about it in my flesh, I should keep it, trade it in for another vehicle I need. Because you know, I can get something out of it, right? But what is that about? That's about me. And see what God is about? He's about others. He's about you, but he's about you being about others. Because when we think selfishly, we think first about ourselves and what is going to benefit me or not benefit me. If I can afford it or not afford it, you can't afford not to do it. Because if God is asking you to do something, make the move. And a prime example, you're in this room today. You're here. I don't know how you got to be here, what the situation was, but you're here. Did anybody have any struggles this week getting to Sunday? Am I the only one that was going through whatever just to get to Sunday? Amen. You see what I'm saying? Jesus. Man, I mean, I can only imagine in a moment that the Savior of 
the world is hung on the cross. And that everything that he said, every little thing that he talked about, was hanging on the cross. All hope is lost. Because their mindset was, Jesus is going to save us from Rome. And Jerusalem is going to go back to its roots. And Jesus is like, silly rabbit. <laughs> this ain't about Jerusalem. This is about the world. It's about the kingdom exploding. It's about the church growing. And we're here now in the moment. But they couldn't see it because everything he did and he was on the cross. I was driving in this morning, nervous, driving that little car. That car is awesome, kids. Good luck. Man, you put 20 bucks in, go 40. You, you can go for like two weeks on it. $20. Come on. But I was driving and I'm like, just praying. And all of a sudden, I just started thinking about a couple ladies. Can we... Can I just rewind the tape real quick and just say, don't count out some ladies. God's still using women to preach the gospel. Still using women to do all kinds of stuff. And I don't know what happened at churches and stuff. I don't know if they read the same Bible because the word of God was in Mary when she carried him. And most of the major things happened with some women in the Bible. Girls, you better be shouting. I'm setting you free right here. Some of y'all are like, oh, I don't know because my husband might not like that. Hello, women, you're set free. Yeah. Yeah. There you are. And these ladies walk into a tomb with some oils and trying to do something. Our Savior died. And, and they had this. They had, they, they had this promise. Everything he said. And now they're going to go prepare and they're crying. I can't believe what had happened. But we know the story, don't we? We know it well because we talk about it every Sunday. We talk about it every Easter. That when they showed up at the tomb, something happened. Something was going on at the tomb when they got there. At first, they could be mad about it because they're like, oh, because Jesus was, if we're looking at today's deal, he was, he was trendy. He was, but he transcends everything. He had a lot of followers. So people wanted to uh, figure it out. And they thought, well, maybe if, if we take the body, they won't come over here and just keep worshiping this tomb. Wow. I mean, they had these random thoughts. Right. But Jesus, he's a gentleman. And uh, kids, get some advice from him. He makes his bed in the morning, too. He has something laying on there, just all nice and clean, a little cloth sitting there. Ain't nothing there. He comes out. Tombs roll away. Can I, can I encourage, oh, we got to get into this. Can I, and it's all about this. Can I encourage you about something? I know like we have broken places in our personal lives. I know we've been through stuff. Individually, I don't know your story and I'm not taking it lightly. But I can tell you one thing, quit going back to the tomb. Come on. Quit going back to that place thinking that you're going to get a different result at that same place. If he's resurrected, you need to go somewhere and tell somebody. Let him heal you so you can keep moving forward. And I know in this room, and it's crazy, but I know that some people have had some bad things happen, but they still haven't let those things go. And they still have the tomb and still bring memories, flowers, and still in their personal situations. Whether it's somebody that's hurt me or I've been done wrong or whatever the case is, or I've been, I've been the problem and I've done it, so I, I can't get over you know, forgiving myself. You don't need to go to the tomb anymore. And let him set you free. And guess what happens when the sun sets free? They're free indeed. And guess what they do? They stir it up in the city. They tell everybody. Not about, look, I'm set free. But no, look what Jesus has done. Your actions are going to change everything. Your, the, way you, the way your demeanor and everything about you, when it starts to change because of Christ, People will notice that you ain't got to say one word. And because we live in such a weird culture right now with everybody's offended about everything, you have to hold strong and dig your roots deep. He is the anchor of your soul. So when somebody tries to offend you, don't fall apart and feel like everything's an offense. Stand strong and stand on his word and surround yourself with people that are going to lift you up. 
And they might make you mad because they're going to keep you accountable to it. You got this. Come on. Don't go there. Come on. We need that in our lives. I need that in my life. But man, here we are. It's Sunday. The tomb was rolled away. There's chaos in the city. It's supposed to be a good day. I mean, the whole week was supposed to be good. I mean, there's a festival. They're, they're celebrating. But the darkest day happened on a Friday. And what seemed lost was found. He wasn't dead. He was just robbing the grave. He's just robbing hell. Taking keys. He had you in mind. We've been in this thing called murder promises. How we, in a moment, sometimes want to switch it out for a, a, a quick fix. Like a brother selling his inheritance for a cup of soup. Judas was money hungry, so he sold out the, the king of kings for some, some money. This was a quick stack, that's all I need. Real quick, Adam and Eve selling it out over one tree, two bites, lost the garden. Instantly. And now we got the change up. The true barter promise. Where Jesus Christ will barter his whole entire life for you to live. Will hang on a tree so that you can have life more abundantly. There's hope. There's hope in the cross. And, and, and if, when you go through stuff, and you, and you might think of this like, you don't know what I've been through. Anybody ever said that? I've said that. You don't know what I've been through. But the reality is, Jesus knows what you've been through. And he can heal that. And the cross, it equals love because always he did it for love. He tripped up the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, which, what's the better commandment? What's the greatest? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, body, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. It's equally as important. The two greatest commandments are right here. So we're going to dig in this for a few minutes. And I want you, this is how we've been doing church. God's told us to hold for it, and we're still holding it. Since last year, we were looking in the camera to nobody. And still trying to just keep moving. I want to have uh, Pastor Josh go. But before he goes... Because he's going to take off from that. It's his birthday today. Pastor Chuck. Come after me. I'll give him a hug. Brother's hug. Brother's hug. Let's dig into this. Let me say something real quick before I start on this. Place. God wrecked me up on when we and we I can't even talk. Woo! No, I'm telling you, when I was up there, God just started wrecking me. I was up in a high place. <laughs> Burning up. Jesus, it's hot up there. Anyway, yeah, so. Jesus. Yeah, I'm about to get set free. So, uh. <laughs> that's me up. Oh <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I was up there, and God just reminded me that two weeks before Easter, 24 years ago, He rescued me. And what's so crazy is today's my birthday on Resurrection Sunday, and I just think it's so awesome that I've had 24 years to really live. That's right. Because I've been living for 24 years. Pastor Day, I figured it out. Pastor Day told me, he said, pick an age and let's stick with that, and when you figure out how to stay there, let me know. I figured it out. I'm 24 years old. <laughs> Because 24 years ago, I got resurrected on a Sunday morning, two weeks before Easter. So, whenever that was for you, preacher, live it, man. Live it. So, anyway, good stuff. But I'm grateful, I'm thankful that I've had 24 years of living true life and getting the, the opportunity to preach the gospel and share with people the life-changing message and power of a risen Savior that will never die again in this kingdom is established for eternity. Isn't that powerful? It's more powerful than your shout. 
Jesus goes to the garden to be obedient to the Father, undoing Adam and Eve's disobedience in the garden. I found this online and it just shook me, man, as I began to read it. Uh, I began to kind of dig a little bit. And isn't it intriguing that Jesus had to go to a garden before he ever went to a cross? He went to the garden of Gethsemane because the redemption process had to touch everything that was forfeited and bartered. So he had to go to a garden called Gethsemane. And in Gethsemane, he prayed and, and said things like, Father, if, if this cup could pass from me, even so, not my will, but yours be done. See, he had to regenerate the will that Adam forfeited so that he could say, Father, it's not my will that needs to be done in this garden, but it's yours that needs to be done. I understand the first Adam gave up something that he, you intended for him to live in and walk into the cool of the day with, with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He forfeited that moment, but I'm in this garden today and I'm going to regenerate and recreate what you intended for people to live in from day one. So I'm going to pray here. And even though I'm hurting right now, even though I'm struggling right now, I'm going to stay in this fight and I'm going to say, whatever your will is, if I have to go to this cross, then so be it. I'm going to do it for our people. Isn't that powerful? He had to start in a garden. Adam and Eve hides behind a tree, naked, covered in shame. Jesus hangs on a tree, naked, and conquers shame. You want me to say that? Adam and Eve hides behind a tree, naked, covered in shame. Jesus hangs on a tree, naked, and conquers shame. Isn't that powerful? So here's what's crazy. He goes to a garden to redeem it. Then he goes to a tree to hang on it. Because what Adam and Eve did was ate from a tree that caused them to fall. Now he hangs on a tree that causes him, them to rise. He took every bit of our shame. He took every bit of our guilt. He took every bit of our sickness and disease that, that was caused by the stumbling of, of people in a garden. And he takes it all on himself. And he hangs it on a cross. Adam and Eve begin in paradise, but are forced outside the gates due to the curse. Jesus dies outside the gates, but ends up in paradise due to the cross. He said, I'm going to take the curse upon myself, and I'm going to hang it upon a tree. And isn't it funny that back then it was actually, you were considered a cursed man if you were hung on a tree. Jesus says, I'm going to take the curse that was placed by Adam and Eve due to their sin that came upon humanity. I'm going to take it all upon myself and I'm going to hang as a cursed man upon a tree and I'm going to redeem my people once and for all. Because the curse didn't come down, he did. The curse didn't come down off the tree. Jesus came down off the tree. So powerful. Woo. Adam and Eve's sin ushered a curse of thorns. Jesus wears a crown of thorns as he ushered in salvation from sin. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? They had to go till the ground and live with the thorns that came up out of the ground. Jesus takes the crown of thorns and sticks it upon his head as he ushers in salvation for humanity. Listen to this. It's in uh, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4 and 5. Is so good. But in fact, he has become our griefs and he has carried our sorrows and pains. Yet, this is so good. Yet we ignorantly assume that he was stricken, struck down by God and degraded and humiliated by him. Hang on before you move. Go back. I think what we have to remember here is that God, the father, isn't the one that struck him down. It was us. It was our sin. It was our shame. It was our guilt that caused him to have to come and redeem his people. The beautiful part of it was, though, is that he did it with joy. Yeah. He did it knowing that it was going to set his people free and that we would have life and have it more abundantly. Isn't that beautiful? The things that we bartered in the past, he bartered for on the cross and gave it back to us as our inheritance. And that is eternal life. Keep going. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our wickedness, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing. The punishment required for our well-being fell on him. 
And by his stripes or wounds, we are healed. I wrote this down. Wounded for our transgression means infringement or violation of the law, command, or duty. He was crushed for our wickedness, the quality of being evil or morally wrong. He took the violation of our sin upon himself. He took our violations of the law upon himself and he said, I'm going to set you free from this forever. You will never have to be a slave to it ever again. The problem we have today is that we forgot what he did on the cross and we keep becoming slaves of the things that he set us free from. The reason we do this is because we forget our identity. Our identity isn't found in what we've been labeled by. Our identity is found what he did on the cross. It's found only through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's found in him. The punishment or sacrifice for our well-being. I love that. He took the punishment that was required for our well-being. He knew that he had to take it all upon himself. When he was at that whipping post and the stripes that were laid across his back, the, the stripes that were laid across his body were for our wounds, were for our transgressions, were for our sins, so that we could be healed completely. See, we look at healing as something physically in the body all the time, but he was healing your mind. He was healing your emotions. He was healing the brokenness of your heart. He was setting you free from the labels of religious things that people would try to put on you so that you would stay a slave in bondage to sin and to religion. Huh. Can I just do something real quick? You want to help me? I'm going to stand up. Stand up real, with me real quick. Take this off. Okay? Take it off. See, some of us walked in with our coats of religion over our shoulder today. We walked in with them. And can I be honest with you? I should have been wearing this jacket because... Fat guy in a little coat. That thing, was, that thing was killing my arms. I couldn't even lift my arms. I couldn't even lift my arms. And isn't that what religion does to you? It keeps you from lifting your arms. It keeps you from lift, keeps you from praising him when you need to praise him. He just had to shake the religion off of Come me on. today. That religious thing that was sitting on me and wouldn't allow me to lift my hands. That's what he did on the cross. Hello, people. Dude, I felt so weird. I was playing the bass like this. Jesus set me free. My God in heaven, I was sweating. Because in religion and labels, they bind you and they weigh you down. They do. And yet, you know, people go through different things in their life and, and it has formed them to, to something else. You know what I'm saying? So their life is lived like that. And remember, I think you said this last week because... Not this, but about the, what I'm about to say. Jeremy made a statement that he was singing and he was uh, organ man's here somewhere. Where are you at, Jeremy? Oh, hi, buddy. Welcome oh. back. Um, he was talking about how he was in a business. He was spraying and stuff for their bugs and stuff. And uh, they were singing a song and he started singing it. Some song, some church song, some song on the radio. And the lady looked at him and was like, oh, well, I didn't realize you were a, you didn't look like a Christian or a, you know, I don't know what you look like. You just don't look like one, man. You look like Bagger Vance today with your hat, but <laughs> but listen. So so check this out. So they said like, well, you don't look like a, a Christian. So they were really like taken back that this man is out here spraying and like lifting up the name of Jesus, and, like getting it right there in front of everybody. And then he's like, hey, I've been listening to this one song, this song called Crazy Love that we just sang. You should listen to it. He said he went all the way back. And she said, uh, she started listening to it, and he heard her listening to it. And they had a conversation. But you said, when we had this conversation, you know what's crazy? You were talking about how people are spiritually, have a spiritually, a spiritual racism. Yes. And how, what happens is, is we, we say, you know, because people have all been victim to this and, and, and people have done this whole thing where you look at somebody and you make an assumption about this. And you label them. Well, they shouldn't. Well, he don't look like he's a Christian. He's the organ man. He ain't a Christian. <laughs> I don't even know what. Yeah, all day. And, and, you know, we get that at times. Well, you don't look like a pastor. I'm like, what does a pastor look like? 
You know, like, I don't know. But and then our our you don't look like you know the the struggle some people have is like well uh, I don't have church clothes so I can't come. I've never been to a department store and said church clothes over here to the left. <laughs> yeah, three hours right. Come on. And what's church clothes? Like if you want to dress up, dress up. If you want to dress down, dress down. We're just glad you're in the room. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care what religion weighs you down. That code of religion weighs you down. The code of shame, the code of the past, it weighs you down. The labels that stick all over you from your past. I mean, people are still got labels on them from when they were teenagers and they're older adults. He died for that on the cross. Rip the label off or take the shirt off. Do something. Yeah. So, good. so powerful. We don't have to. You want to say anything? Okay, cool. <laughs> Second Corinthians 5.17. I love this in the passage translation. Now, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new person. Amen. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. Man, I started digging into this and God started smacking me with this. And, and he said, listen, this is what I did for my people on the cross. But it wasn't just about me going to the cross. It was also about me rising again. Because he put the old things on the cross to crucify him. But when he rose from the dead, he brought fresh new life to us. Old things have passed away because we fall under the government of the kingdom. All things are new because we have come under the umbrella of the new covenant that Jesus paid for on the cross. His resurrection is the promise of the newness of life in the kingdom that offers us when we say yes to him. He did everything on that cross. He paid the penalty on that cross so that we can have hope again, so that we can have life again. But it didn't stop there. When they put him in the tomb and he rose again three days later, he brought the newness of life and said that if anyone be in Christ, anyone. he is a new creation. Your old things have passed away because of what I did on the cross. And new life has come because what I did three days later. What's crazy? Man, I love Jesus. So like I like him. like him. Like he stirs the pot all the time. Like he walked in the temple and said, "Look, I'm gonna tear it down and build, rebuild it in three days." We're like, "That's a terrorist. We gotta go." So I call him. Twenty seven nineteen. You know. And they flipped out and thought, "This man's coming to tear this place down and he's gonna rebuild it." He, they, they considered him a terrorist. If you called yourself a Christian, you were considered to be a terrorist. And he was talking about what you just said, the resurrection. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tear the temple and I'm going to rebuild it in three days. They're like, there's no possible way. You know how long it took us to build this thing? Yeah. They, but see what happened? And please know, he were, they were talking to what you call so-called Christians or, or believers or followers or the people that read the scrolls. They did not in their mindset get it. And yet they read the Old Testament over and over. And even the Old Testament had so many scriptures that were about the, talking about this guy that was coming. That's going to save the world. That's going to die. And it's going to rise. But they're also the same ones that read the scrolls. Crying out for revival. Crying out for the Messiah. And as he's riding in on a donkey. They're not paying attention anymore. And they allow revival to ride right by. So they're criticized. They're still reading it. Where is he at? He's right here. Right, right by you. Because the problem we have anymore is church folks and people are shining light on light and not seeing a difference. Light only makes a difference in the darkness. And we have to shine the light. Bright. I, I feel like we've been just walking in a revival moment all for this last week and a half. Just reviving the soul. Salvation exploding. New life, new hope for people. God's got something. You good? We just we preaching. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, love. You good? I know you got something to say. <laughs> I was just thinking about the exchange that was made, and if you look at the definition of exchange, it's an act of giving one thing and receiving another, especially of the same type or value in return. And I was thinking about how when Jesus died on the cross and came in, um, going back to the scripture in um, 2 Corinthians 5, 17,
in the Passion Translation that says, Now if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new person. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. And God has made all things new and reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciling others to God. In other words, it was through the anointed one that God was shepherding the whole, the world, not even keeping records of their transgressions. And he has entrusted to us the ministry of opening the door of reconciliation to God. We are ambassadors of the anointed one who carry the message of Christ to the world. As though God were tenderly pleading with them directly through our lips, so we tenderly plead with you on Christ's behalf. Turn back to God and be reconciled to him. For God made the only one who did not know sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God through our union with him. And the word there, the original word for reconcile is uh, catalasso. It means to change or exchange. First for money, but here in individuals from enmity to friendship or to reconcile. If you go to um, Romans chapter 5, and I believe it is verse 10, if you start there, or actually verse 9, it says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I know that's a word that just keeps repeating itself. But what's crazy about that word right there is that in this scripture, it literally meant to exchange. Now, what triggered me about that word is we've been talking about barter promises. To barter is to exchange or trade something. In, in an exchange, when you trade something, it's for a something else that has greater or equal value. And what struck me here is that this exchange did not have equal value. God literally traded for the lesser. He like looked at us and everything that we were going through and was like, he didn't look at it like, man, that's an upgrade. In reality, he looked at it and was like, that's a downgrade, you know what I'm saying? But it, to us, he didn't think of it that way. To us, it was about, he was looking to us as if we were this great prize to be won, this great trade that was this great trophy for him and to be taken care of and to, to love and to cherish. And what's crazy about it is, I begin to think, and, and God began to tell me, he said, I want you to imagine. And so I want you guys to do the same thing with me this morning. I want you to close your eyes for a minute. I want you to imagine. We're going to do a little bit of daydreaming this morning. Is that all right? So I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine. And I want you to think about all the people who have hurt you, denied you, forgotten you, ignored you, abused you, disowned you, hated you, mocked you, gossiped about you, left you, used you, cheated you, were fake to you, and disloyal to you. Think about all those people. Now imagine taking on all those grievances and carrying them, and not only that, but all the sins from lying, stealing, adultery, lust, greed, hate, murder. Take all those. And imagine literally every evil you can think of as well as carrying it too. Now imagine you holding all those things knowing you did nothing to deserve them and neither did you commit any of them. Now imagine that the only way for all of them to be forgiven and put away was for you to die. For your life in exchange for all of their wrongs. Your life, one that only showed love, mercy, compassion, kindness, justness, truth, loyalty, faithfulness, hope, peace, purity, grace, healing, forgiveness, kindness, being the only thing that could trade for them. Now imagine the only way to do so was to be crucified, to be beaten until unrecognizable, to be bruised and crushed, mocked, jeered, hated, then nailed to the cross through your hands and your feet and pierced on your side. Imagine that you know there is no other option. Would you do it? Would you be willing to die for your enemy? Would you be willing to die for all those people who mocked 
you, who jeered you, who cheated you, who denied you, who abused you, who disowned you, who hated you, who gossiped about you, who left you, who are fake and disloyal, would you do it? Would you lay your life down for somebody who is your enemy? Would you lay your life down for the child molester? Would you do it? Would you lay your life down for the murderer? Would you lay your life down for the terrorist? Would you do it? Would you lay your life down in an instant knowing that you were going to take on all of their things and say that it was yours? Say that it was yours, that you were willing to carry it, that, that, you, that you were the one to take on those sins, that they did nothing wrong to excuse them and pardon them and watch them walk out the door knowing that they may not ever thank you one time or love you in return. Would you do it? I'm not going to lie. There's no way I probably would do it. Not like that. Not like that. I'm not going to say that I'm Jesus Christ and would have the ability to do that. Not like that. But what I know is that we have a Savior that literally took an uneven exchange and looked at you as something that was so much value to hold on to. It's powerful. Would you do it? Think about it. Would you? Think about all the people who have hurt you in your life. The things that you may still be holding on to, you can't even let them go. So how could you literally let go to allow forgiveness to come in? Forgiveness is the greatest gift. And it's not for them, it's for you. And so that you can allow God to come in and do great things in your life so that you don't have anything keeping a barrier between you and him. And the problem of it is, is that we don't look at God that way. See, we don't look at him. See, we're, we're forgiven. We know Jesus just like that. That's that religious jacket. I know God and I'm a Christian. And we wear it well. But I think sometimes we forget that sometimes during the day, you're the one who mocks him. You're the one who cheats him. You're the one who denies him. You're the one who disowns him. You're disloyal to him. We do it every day by choices that we make because we don't want to give up everything in return for the one who gave up everything for us. And that's the crazy part about it. It's not an even trade. It never was and it never will be. But thank God that he thinks that you have value enough to love you enough in where you are to know that you can be forgiven and to know that you can walk away being a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And today that you can be turned around and saved and renewed and redeemed and restored and reconciled to come in and walk in righteousness with Jesus Christ. That's the power of the cross. What is your soul worth? Consider the price that was paid for it. Then make a determination. What's your soul worth? Think about the value of what God gave up to secure our eternal souls. The blood of Jesus was God's own life. I didn't hear you. The blood of Jesus was God's own life. What's your soul worth? It was the ultimate one-sided barter transaction. God brought his own son on the cross of Calvary. All we bring to the table is debt and sin. It's one-sided. It's a one-sided transaction. What's your soul worth? What could be possible to God to give exchange for what we give? The value that he saw in us and see, see, sometimes we don't see that in ourselves. We don't see the worth. But see, it's okay sometimes that we don't see that because, see, he took all that for us. And so, see, sometimes we hold ourselves in that place that we don't have that worth or that value when, in reality, God sent his only son because he could see the value in us. I'm going to read this real quick, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. 
But I want to read verse 20 in the message. You were God's expensive purchase. So by all means, use your body to bring glory to God. Come on. You were God's expensive purchase. See, some of you don't think you're expensive. Some of you don't think that you're an expensive purchase. And by all means, use your body for the glory of God. You are not your own. We bring nothing to the table but sin and debt. Some of you have sin and debt. And he's saying you're expensive. Why don't you stand with me? Jesus bargained for our soul. It's valuable because it cost. And it took him to redeem our lives. He bargained for our soul. You didn't hear that. He bargained for our soul. He thought that we were expensive. And some of you don't think that you're expensive. Some of you don't think that you're worth anything. But God sent his only son to die on the cross for us because he valued us. I want you to close your eyes. This is a moment. This is a time. And just like 24 years ago, When you walk down from a drunken stupor at a house with all these men passed out everywhere and you walked because you felt the womb of God upon you, even when you didn't understand everything that was going on. And you ran as fast as you could. And sometimes he finds us in a church. Sometimes he finds us on the street. Sometimes he finds us giving out a piece of candy to somebody. Sometimes he finds us wherever he finds us because he knows that we're expensive to him. Amen. You're valued. Man, I'm, just, I'm so stirred because I think some of you feel like you're too far away. <laughs> you're never too far away from his reach. And here's the beautiful thing. The religious will tell you that you're too far. The religious will tell you you're too far because they'll never come into a bar to rescue you. They'll never come into the dark alleys to rescue you. But isn't it funny that Christ went to the dark place to pay the penalty for us and I was in a dark place in an apartment with 40 other people getting high and drunk and he chose to allow his spirit to come in there and begin to tug on me and begin to rescue me in a moment because he knew I was valuable to him. The enemy wants you to feel like you're not valuable enough. He wants you to feel like you're too far out of God's reach. But I'm here to tell you that you're not too far. It doesn't matter how deep in the sin you've gone. Because the one who knew no sin took it all upon himself and hung on a cross for you. And this morning, he's standing up here with his arms wide open, just waiting to embrace you because he loves you that much. He's such a father that he's been waiting for you at the bottom of the hill and he's just waiting for you to come over. And he doesn't need you to come and bow before him and say, Father, I'm not good enough. Because what he's going to do for you this morning is he's going to put a new robe on you. He's going to put new sandals on you. And he's going to put his signet ring upon you because he did it on the cross for you. You're not too far away. You're not too far away. You're actually in the right place at the right time in the right moment. And if you're watching by TV or video right now, I need you to understand, even though you're sitting there and you're not in this house, he's sitting in your house right now. He was sitting with me at a party 25 years ago and I didn't realize it. Come on. If you're here this morning and you feel like you've been out of God, God's reach, if you feel like you, you're not valuable enough or not good enough, here's the gospel. He came to pay a price to show you how valuable you are to Him. Oh, For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that, listen to this, that whosoever, that includes everybody. We're all included. Those that struggle with sin, those that struggle with whatever they've got going on in their life, those that are sick, those that are diseased, who, whosoever will come needs to come. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting
everlasting life. I just feel a stir in this place this morning that there are some of you that have felt so lost, so forgotten, and so hopeless. But today in the house, there's a man by the name of Hope, and his name is Jesus Christ. of human experience conceived in a virgin womb. Heaven's perfection breathes his first in a barn. The fullness of God beats in the heart of a helpless infant. This is the genius of his birth. The requirements of the law outmatched by the righteousness of God. Sovereign simplicity confounds the wisdom of this world. Relentless mercy humbles the proud and heals the broken. This is the genius of his life. The light of the world wrapped in our darkness. Freedom and strength bound in our weakness. The peacemaker pierced, the creator destroyed, the power to save spent not for himself, this is the genius of his cross. Death's signature victory stripped by love's ultimate triumph. Hell's finest hour eclipsed by the dawning of grace. Limitless hope lives again in all who believe. This is the genius of resurrection. The lamb slain so that man no more may die. The suffering servant before whom all will bow. His finished work is the fountain of all new beginnings. This is the way. This is the truth. This is the life. This is the genius of Jesus. <laughs>